Hello friends, I'm Maya Soma and today we will be looking into some of the mythologies around women in Buddhism. Once we have been practicing and engaging in traditional Buddhist circles for some time, it is not long before we will hear the unfortunate story that the Buddha was not too fond of giving full monastic ordination to women. We are told that yes, he did ordain women, but he did so reluctantly. The legend goes that Mahapajapati Gotami, the Buddha's foster mother, came with a group of 500 women to request full ordination from the Buddha. He rejected her request three times in a row and then sent them home. The Buddha's attendant, Ananda, found Mahapajapati weeping in despair after being denied ordination and went to the Buddha to make the request again on the women's behalf. The Buddha again denied Ananda's request three more times. Ananda then cross-questioned the Buddha, who admitted that women were capable of attaining the same stages of enlightenment up to full awakening that men were. The Buddha then consented to giving Mahapajapati ordination, but only under the condition that she accept the eight Garudamas, the eight rules to be respected, sometimes called the eight heavy rules, eight rules that enforce a submissive and inferior role to the male monastics. After she accepted these rules, comparing them to a garland of flowers she would don around her head, the Buddha gives the ordination to the women and states that his action has the consequence of making his teaching remain half as long as it would have otherwise lasted and compared their ordination to a disease that kills plants quickly. This story appears twice in the Theravada Buddhist canon, once in the Chulavaga of the Vinaya Pitaka, the monastic discipline, and once in the Anguttara Nikaya, a collection of discourses at Anguttara Nikaya 851. Before we go into the rules in detail, it is important to look at how this story fits in with the other narratives on women and bhikkhunis throughout the canon. As a matter of fact, whenever we encounter any teachings attributed to the Buddha, first and foremost, it is important that we remember the four great standards or Mahapadesas, that the Buddha was said to teach before his passing in Diga Nikaya 16, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and also at Anguttara Nikaya 4.180, the Mahapadesa Sutta. These are four standards for measuring if a teaching, discourse, or practice is likely to be authentic and in line with the Buddha's true teachings. This only makes sense if we know that there were, or would have soon been, misinformation and faulty stories floating around that needed to be filtered from the truth. The four standards mentioned by the Buddha can be summarized in brief as whether one claims that something was said by the Buddha or by senior disciples or revered teachers, whenever we hear something that claims to be Dhamma, we should carefully examine and remember it without accepting or rejecting at first. Then we should carefully compare it with other trustworthy teachings and training practices received. Once it has been compared with the rest, we can approve or reject it, depending on if there are inconsistencies or contradictions in the ideas presented. When we recognize the potential risks in trusting every text passed down in a religious scripture, we can also start to open up to the possibilities that certain texts or passages or not reliable accounts of the Buddha's own opinion or choices. We can start to look with a more curious, investigative attitude towards the tradition, without turning away from the deeper truths that the Buddha pointed us towards. In essence, we want to make sure we don't throw away the baby with the bathwater. So let's look into some of the details of the origin story and how historically reliable of an account it seems to be in comparison with other information from the early Buddhist texts. While the background story to the eight Garudamas is probably the most frequently cited text for understanding the Buddha's attitudes towards bhikkhuni ordination, it is by far not the only one that talks about the topic. There are actually many passages in other discourses which explicitly reference the importance and necessity of the bhikkhuni community to the Buddha's vision of the Sangha, or his community of disciples. These contradict the attitudes present in the origin myth with Mahapajapati Gotami, making it seem much more like an outlier than a main point of reference. 
Adhika Nikaya 29, the Pasadika Sutta, the Buddha says that his dispensation would not be complete if it did not have a complete and flourishing community of four assemblies. That's bhikkhunis, bhikkhus, laymen, laywomen. Not only does this praise the presence of bhikkhunis in the Buddha's dispensation, it also highlights the importance in having senior, middle, and junior bhikkhunis who are competent, learned, and have attained awakening. This is quite a different message from comparing women in the Sangha to a destructive crop disease that we find in the story with Mahapajapati. Amadjuva Nikaya 68, the Nalakapana Sutta, the Buddha says that he discloses where his disciples are reborn after death for the sake of inspiring people with similar identities to gain inspiration and make a resolve to practice the path. Here, he also mentions the fourfold assembly and the importance of having inspiration in role models who are part of the noble Sangha, that is, both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Also, at Manjua Nikaya 73, the Mahavachagota Sutta, it is stated clearly that if there were not the four assemblies of householders and monastics accomplished in the Dhamma, the spiritual path laid down by the Buddha would be deficient in this aspect. It is a point of pride for the Buddha's dispensation that it offers a complete and perfect path, not deficient in any way or aspect, and the Buddha himself says as much in this discourse. There are not just 100, nor 2, or 3, or 4, or 500, but many more bhikkhuni disciples of mine than that, who with the ending of the defilements live having realized with their own insight the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by understanding in this very life. A passage at Dika Nikaya 16, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is repeated several other places in the canon, features Mara trying to convince the Buddha to attain Parinibbana. Mara quotes a statement that the Buddha made shortly after his awakening, where he declared that he would not leave the world until he had established a complete set of knowledgeable bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, laymen, and laywomen disciples. This implies then that even since the very beginning, when the Buddha decided to teach, he was already planning on having women renunciants alongside men who followed his teachings. These passages and others show us that the attitudes towards women and bhikkhunis in the origin myth with Mahapajapati Gautami are not the standard view of the early Buddhist texts. There are just one voice among many other voices that give us a different, more positive and rational message. But the inconsistent attitude towards bhikkhunis with the other early texts is not the only warning sign that the story with Mahapajapati may not be a reliable account of history. There are several other issues as well. The story says that having women in the monastic Sangha will lead to faster decline of the Dhamma and the Buddha's dispensation in the world. But when other texts in the canon talk about the decline of the Buddha's dispensation, the sex or gender of the members involved is not an issue. The issue is instead the practice, the respect, and transmission of the teachings themselves, as we would expect. For example, two discourses, Samyutta Nikaya 16.13 and Anguttara Nikaya 5.201, say that the decline of the Buddha's teaching comes when the four assemblies including both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, do not respect the triple gem, the training, or deep meditation. This implies also that the problem is not the four assemblies or one among them. In fact, the four assemblies, including bhikkhunis, respecting these things is said to prevent the decline of the Dhamma. This focuses on the actions and behaviors that have certain consequences, no matter what the identity of the person is. We can see how the message here is much more in line with the Buddha's overall teaching. Other discourses say that the true Dhamma does not last when people do not properly learn, memorize, and recite the correct phrasing or meaning of the discourses, like in Anguttara Nikaya 5.154. This is another very rational and reasonable explanation for the process of change and decline. These discourses offer a voice of clarity and sanity, whereas in the origin myth with Mahapajapati Gotami, the tone is more of fear and defensiveness, like in the final simile where the text compares the eight rules for women to a moat protecting a fortress, an image of powerful institutions in fear from dangerous enemies who would dismantle the power structure. 
We have seen how the story with Mahapajapati is not in line with other Dhamma principles outlined in the discourses. So the question now is, how can we distinguish right from wrong? What is the truth? And how do we know a reliable account from a suspicious one? Early discourses like the Kesamutta Sutta, also known as the Kalama Sutta, the Sandaka Sutta, or the Chanki Sutta, emphasize the dangers and confusion that can arise when we rely on oral tradition or canonical scripture alone for knowing the truth. The other discourses we mentioned earlier about unreliable discourses and teachings being passed down also show the Buddha's awareness that even Buddhist texts are not infallible sources of the Buddha's ideas, just because they're passed down as being Buddhist scripture. Take another teacher who's an oral transmitter, who takes oral transmission to be the truth. They teach by oral transmission, by the lineage of testament, by canonical authority. But when a teacher takes oral transmission to be the truth, some of that is well learned, some poorly learned, some true, and some otherwise. We have already looked at some suspicious messages underlying the background for the eight Garudamas by comparing the Buddha's other statements on the Sangha and preservation of his teaching. Now let's dig deeper into the details of the story. The Pali discourses come with a very special feature of a complete set of ancient commentaries passed down by the Buddhist tradition. These contain stories, teachings, opinions, and details from many different people, mostly monastics from a broad time period. They do not have the same claim to historical accuracy or being the word of the Buddha, but they can be helpful to get access to a rich tradition of learning and legend surrounding the discourses. According to the commentaries, Mahapajapati and her 500 followers were ordained five years after the Buddha's awakening. But Ananda, who in the story is the attendant of the Buddha, did not take on that role until 20 years after the Buddha's dispensation, according to the same sources. There is also an early sutta called the Dakinavibhanga Sutta, Jyanikaya 142, which features Mahapajapati Gotami as a laywoman. This would have to be before she went forth as a monastic, as she sewed a garment which the Buddha instructs her to give to the entire monastic Sangha, not just him. The discourse also says that she has taken refuge in the Triple Gem, follows the five precepts, and is a stream enterer. The five precepts are for lay people, while Buddhist monastics have many more. Later on, the Buddha teaches about gifts given to a community of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. If Mahapajapati was the first bhikkhuni, it would not make sense for the Buddha to teach and encourage giving gifts to a community of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis in her presence. This is also inconsistent with the message in our origin story as well, where the Buddha is depicted as being reluctant and not wanting to ordain bhikkhunis. These chronological details between the discourses and the commentaries show that the origin myth itself is at odds with several points. It is also, again, inconsistent with the message elsewhere that bhikkhunis are a positive and important part of the Sangha. Another detail worth mentioning is that according to tradition, Ananda also attained awakening after the Buddha's death. This depicts the Buddha as giving in to the pleas of an unawakened monk against his own reason and his own attitudes in other discourses which show the Buddha praising bhikkhunis and even teaching this to Ananda, not the other way round. It seems that there must be some other underlying motivations in the origin story that have to do with these three main characters, the Buddha, Ananda, and Mahapajapati, and depicting them in a different light from the norm. Apart from the general attitude towards women and bhikkhuni ordination that stands out, the reality is that the eight Garudamas presented in their origin story are quite strange. Moving on from the discourses from now, we can also look at how they relate to other rules in the Vinaya, the Book of Monastic Conduct. The eight Garudamas do not appear as a set in the Bhikkhuni Patimokkha, the official rules for recitation and they're also not part of the bhikkhuni ordination script, even though they're present as a precondition for ordination according to the origin story. Of the eight rules, there are seven pachitya rules in the bhikkhuni patimokkha that parallel seven garudamas. However, the origin story for each one is different from the story with Mahapajapati, and other early vinayas do not even have the same relevant pachityas. 
Anya Tataloka-Terry has done some beautiful research in which she has pointed out that this means that when we do textual comparison, these rules do not have strong marks of authenticity. In fact, she also points out how in the Dharmagupta Kavinaya, another ancient Buddhist school closely related to the modern Theravada school, adds the story at the very end of its Kandaka. This could show that the story was added onto this Vinaya late, towards the very end of its composition. On top of all of this, there is not really any intertextual agreement about what the eight Bhikkhuni Garudamas are. They are not only unclear, minor, and tucked away from major Vinaya procedures, they are also not a clear list in and of themselves. Each extant Vinaya tradition from the early Buddhist schools has their own version of the list. We should also note that in the story itself, the eight Garudamas are said to be accepted only by Mahapajapati Gotami herself. So between these rules not coming as a set in Vinaya procedures and the description in the passage presenting them, there is no explicit rule that other bhikkhunis must follow them. It is also worth pointing out here that the story is fundamentally a Vinaya narrative from the Kandakas. It does not properly belong in the Sutta Pitaka genre. Although we also find it in the Pali discourses, it is found in the Anguttara Nikaya, which contains several fragments from the Vinaya that have been moved into the discourse form from their original place. This is a standard feature of the Anguttara Nikaya, to be a place for storing and sorting miscellaneous passages and edited segments because of its structure. Some other interesting questions we could ask ourselves are, was Mahapajapati Gotami really the first bhikkhuni to be ordained? And did her ordination really unfold as it's presented in these texts? In our early sources, it seems that in the time of the Buddha, ordination is not presented in the same light as the current Vinaya material. Often, ordinations are very simple and equated with going forth, or pabaja, and are usually said to be done by saying a simple statement along the lines like, come, monk. We also see young boys being ordained in the Tiragata before the age of 20, and in the Tirigata, the verses of the elder bhikkhunis, Patta Kundalakesa says that her ordination was simply the Buddha saying, Ehi, Patta, come, Patta. The ordinations given by the Buddha calling a disciple are generally understood to have happened before there were many formal rules and procedures in place, or when the Sangha was still a unified group with the living Buddha as spiritual guide. Over time, the Vinaya sources recognize a shift towards other forms of more elaborate ordinations and formalized rules and procedures surrounding acts of the Sangha. The fact that Bhatta Kundalakesa says her ordination was done by the Buddha alone and merely by calling her to the Sangha is a strong indication that this was very early on and before elaborate Vinaya procedures. Likewise, although Mahapajapati Gotami is often remembered as a leader for women in the Bhikkhuni Sangha, the one who fought for the establishing of the order and a teacher guiding many young disciples, none of this is mentioned at all in the Tirigata. There are Bhikkhunis referencing their teachers and disciples, and Mahapajapati has a poem of her own. But they do not recollect or discuss the founding of the Bhikkhuni Sangha as any particularly momentous struggle or occasion, let alone with Mahapajapati Gotami heading it. In fact, as we see in the story of Pata Kundalakesa and other women, both in the discourses and verses of the Tirigata, there were already female ascetics and religious or contemplative mendicants and wanderers living in the time of the Buddha. This included the Jains, Brahmins, and likewise other smaller groups or individuals during contemplative practices. This means that it would have not been particularly revolutionary or earth-shattering to have more contemplative mendicants who were women around on the part of the Buddha. The overall attitude seems more to be matter-of-factly that women came, learned the Dhamma, left home, and found liberation along the same lines as the men. We should also remember that the term for male and female monastics in Buddhism, bhikkhu and bhikkhuni, are the exact same word. They're only different in their grammatical gender. This is like the English pair waiter and waitress. They do not refer to different positions, but the same position with the same word varied only in form for the gender of the person involved. In Pali or other Indic languages, this difference is even less pronounced. When referring to people, the noun will change the grammatical gender, 
but in most translations, this would be irrelevant. For example, if we say she is a nurse or he is a nurse, the term nurse is the same. In Pali, the same word would be used, but with a change in grammatical gender to agree with the pronoun he or she. It is not that the word itself is changing meaning, just that it is agreeing with the subject, like is implied in the English sentence. Even though this may seem like a small detail, it is actually quite significant and goes to show what could be part of the Buddha's real contribution to women renunciants. Many other monastic orders refer to men and women with different terminology, wearing different outfits and holding different roles in ecclesiastical structures. It seems that the early Buddhist community was not interested in creating fundamentally different forms, but simply in letting go of mundane pursuits and practicing the Dhamma for final liberation, regardless of our current particular gender. The appearance of the robe, shaved hair, and bowl are the same for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, creating a sangha without built-in appearances of gender division. So what does this all mean for bhikkhuni ordination? It shows that, looking at other secondary evidence and context in the discourses, Bikuni ordination would not have been seen as particularly shocking or revolutionary. It was simply a part of contemplative life that both men and women participated in, and ordaining was likely not a particularly elaborate or ritualistic ceremony early on. It was surely a significant event for someone to go forth into homelessness, but not a complicated question. What would be revolutionary would be to try and deny women who have already renounced the world and practice a contemplative life from being with a community of Dhamma practitioners under the Buddha. The Dhamma itself taught by the Buddha places little to no emphasis on the issue of gender or one's body. And this extends even to the early Sangha having little distinction between male and female monastics. It was just really not a big deal. As I had previously spoken about in my introduction to the Terigata, which you can find the links of in the description of the video, today we have so many preconceived ideas about the state of womanhood at the time of the Buddha that we overlook important details in the tradition that depict quite a different scenario than the inferiority of women. We have accounts such as the one of Sundari renouncing her father's inheritance in order to go forth, highlighting an economic independence that wasn't even available to most women in the West a century ago. Or we have accounts of Brahmin ladies having male students in the suttas. This erroneous way of looking at history and tradition, stemming from the idea that today's world is naturally better than yesterday's world, and that technological progress means cultural progress, makes us give credit to the Buddha for things that he shouldn't be credited for, like giving ordination to women, as he definitely wasn't the first one to do so, but not actually acknowledging that his biggest contribution was to in fact go beyond gender altogether and offer us all awakening beyond bodily and cultural constraints. So in this slide, if we think about the disciples of the Buddha, what was really impressive about the monastic Sangha was not the day they went forth on the, the Buddha, but the qualities that they were capable of developing when they were taught by the Buddha and that made his Sangha shine and become the third jewel. When the Buddha talks about having hundreds and hundreds of bhikkhu and bhikkhuni followers, he talks about them in terms of having attained liberation, not just in terms of numbers or followers. For example, in Majjhima Nikaya 32, the Maha Gosinga Sutta, the main disciples of the Buddha are all said to be shining in the forest due to the remarkable qualities that they have developed. And the Buddha describes the best disciple as someone who puts so much effort into developing wholesome qualities that then will result in all of these different beautiful examples of disciples. So I would say that in the recollection that we do of the foremost disciples, where we see Anya Kundanya and Mahapajapati Gotami as the disciples that are more longstanding, perhaps the connotation is not really on when they went forth, but rather on when they actually entered the stream and what happened after they entered. The word Ratanyu, which is usually translated as seniority or long-standing, attributed to Mahapajapati and to Anya Kondanya, could perhaps hold a different connotation than the date of ordination. While it's true that the word Ratanyu is a word used generally to refer to seniority in the sense of Vasas, we see that in the Buddha's dispensation, the Buddha is very clear that seniority has a deeper meaning than just referring to the length of time in which one has been in robes. 
Indica di Karya Tsu, the Samanya Pala Sutta, the other ascetics at the time of the Buddha, are all defined as Raptanyo, with the literal meaning of being scenery and dasas, except for the Buddha, who is on the other hand defined as fully awakened and perfected, which is what inspires King Ajatasattu to go and visit him and learn the real fruits of an ascetic life well spent. The historical Buddha attained awakening at a fairly young age, and in Anguttara Nikaya 4.22, the Dutiya Rubela Sutta, the Buddha is in fact being admonished by several Brahmins for not paying respects to elder ascetics. So is his disciple Kachana in Anguttara Nikaya 2.32, the Samachitta Vaga. Both reply that it is not just simply by becoming older that one becomes an elder, but by purifying the mind from the kilesas, its impurities. If someone young in age, like the Buddha was when he attained awakening, had completely purified their mind, one was to be considered an elder. Throughout the suttas, it is highlighted that a true senior is ethical, restrained, very learned, obtains the jhanas with ease, and most importantly, they realize the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life, and they live having realized it with their own insight due to the ending of defilements. In the Dhammapada, we see this concept reiterated. You don't become a senior by getting some gray hairs, for one ripe only in age is said to have aged in vain. One who has truth and principle, harmlessness, restraint, and self-control. That wise one, purged of stains, is said to be a senior. So it would seem very strange, and not quite in accordance with Dhamma, that in recollecting the foremost disciples in the Padmavaka, we would recollect first the ones, male and female, that were simply the first ones to ordain. It would make much more sense that it would be in relation to when they first became real elders, as in they became the Arya Sangha, fully awakened and perfected in every possible sense. That is in fact how the Buddha says Kundanya should be remembered the moment he attains dream entry, as Anya, the one who knows, not as the first bhikkhu who received ordination. That would have been a little odd since Kundanya was already matter-of-factly a bhikkhu, a mendicant ascetic, beforehand as were the other four ascetics, which is why they are referred to as the five bhikkhus throughout the suttas, even before they were said to have formally ordained under the Buddha. In Sanyutta Nikaya 8.9, the Kundanya Sutta, we find a similar gist. The elder Vangisa refers to Kundanya as Buddhanu Buddha Tero, the senior monk who became a Buddha right after the Buddha. And in fact, we look, if we look even more deeply into the sources in the canon, we can find in the Apadanas an interesting description for the Patama quality that Anya Kundanya would become remembered for. In the seventh year after the Buddha will declare the truth, he whose name will be Kundanya will be the first one to grasp it. Once again, Kundanya is defined not the first one to ordain, but the first one to grasp the Dhamma. So since in the Patama Sutta he's defined as Ratanyo, we can see that there is much evidence that the meaning of Ratanyo has to do with understanding the Dhamma rather than ordination. If Gotami was in fact the foremost at being a true elder, a Buddhanu Buddha, it would even make perfect sense that she first attained stream entry as a laywoman, as recorded in the Dakinavibanga Sutta when there were already bhikkhunis, and then went forth as a monastic later, when she then became a true elder by developing fully all the admirable qualities pertaining to sila, samadhi, and panya. So now that we've given this preliminary overview, we can look at the Garudamma's rules one by one in the next video. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions or feedback, feel free to add them in the comments below. May you be well and happy, and may all good things come to you. Sadu, sadu, sadu.